evening, everybody. Ig Nobel Prizes, as many of you know, are awarded for things that make people laugh and then think. Most of the new 2023 Ig Nobel Prize winners are here with us tonight in this room. Tonight, the winners will ask each other questions about their work. That's the whole event. Ig Nobel Prize winners asking each other questions about what they did that won an Ig Nobel Prize. To keep the discussions intimate, we're dividing all of this into little groups. So four little discussion groups, one after the other, not simultaneously. Each group will be facilitated by a combination of people. And those people facilitating it are Karen Hopkin. And Karen, if you could stand and take a, a bow. Karen is a biochemist. She's the co <laughs> She's co-author of the textbook Essential Cell Biology, and she is the creator of the Stud Muffins of Science calendar. Do we have any Stud Muffins with us this evening? No. Also, Danny Adams. Danny? Danny is a biologist, a pioneer. A pioneer in the field of bioelectricity, and she's chief science officer of Lucell Diagnostics, which is a company. <laughs> and Eric Maskin. Eric is a professor of economics at Harvard University. <laughs> and he has a Nobel Prize in economics. <laughs> and me, I created the Ig Nobel Prize ceremony. This event, <laughs> thank you. This event is a collaboration between Improbable Research, the gang of us who organized the Ig Nobel Prizes, and the MIT Museum. And it's a, a sort of joyous reunion. The very first Ig Nobel Prize ceremony, way back in 1991, happened in the old MIT Museum building. This is the brand new building. In case you're not aware of it, this is a new building. The museum just moved everything down the street. Um, we're happy you're here. We have eight of this year's 10 Ig Nobel Prizes. We're able to send representatives. The other two were not able to travel. And the winners all kindly, and I thank you all winners, kindly found a way to get themselves from around the world to here tonight. The first discussion group is sitting right here. Let me introduce them. Christine Pham, if you could stand and take a bow or sit and take a bow. Christine traveled here from Irvine, California. She and her team won the Ig Nobel Medicine Prize for using cadavers to explore whether there's an equal number of hairs in each of a person's two nostrils. Maybe you want to stand and take another bow. Her colleague, Natasha Mesinskovska, is also here and will be in one of the later discussion groups. Natasha, if you'd like to stand and take a bow. Also here is Chris Moulin. Chris traveled here from Grenoble, France. He and his team won the Ig Nobel Literature Prize for studying the sensations many people feel when they repeat a single word many, 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 many times. Chris, take a bow, another. Uh, Chris's colleague Akira O'Connor is here and will be in one of the later groups. Akira, if you could stand and take a bow. And Bieto Fernandez Castro. Bieto? Vieto traveled here from Southampton, England. He and his team won the Ig Nobel Physics Prize for measuring the extent to which ocean water mixing is affected by the sexual activity of anchovies. Okay. And Eric Maskin, who you've met, and who will take, I hope, another bow. And this is what we'll do at the start of each discussion group. To give you some context, we'll begin with tiny 
one minute long descriptions by the Ig Nobel winners of what they did. So then after that, we'll have the discussion. First of these one minute introductions is by Christine Fan. Christine? Sitting down or standing up? Up to you. Okay. All right, hi everyone. My name is Christine Pham. I'm a medical doctor specializing in dermatology at the University of California, Irvine. And our project was measuring and quantifying the amount of nose hairs in cadavers. So here's my little nose prop. So we found that there were about 120 nose hairs in the left nostril and about 112 nose hairs in the right nostril. This was non-significant though, and very similar in both nose. But that also, we found that nose hairs grow about one centimeter inward in the nostrils. So all the way right here. Um, so thank you very much. I hope you found that um, very informative. <laughs> and I'm ex very excited to have this Noseworthy Award. <laughs> The next one minute summary is Akira. Oh, oh so Akira, no, Akira was originally going to do this. We swapped people around. Chris Mullen. Chris? Thank you. Uh, okay, so in one minute, 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 I will explain to you why it's important to study what happens when we repeat something until it becomes meaningless. Unlike modern society, the brain is capable of doing its own fact checking. This kind of error elimination is what we are interested in in our day-to-day -day research, an ability called metacognition. Mostly, we study déjà vu. Here, the fact-checking comes along to tell you that although this scene or conversation feels familiar, you know it is impossible that life is repeating. But progress is slow for déjà vu. It is infrequent in, in daily life, and it's difficult to provoke in the lab. So we turn to its opposite, jamais vu, Jamais vu is the feeling that something you know to be familiar is weird. Like that feeling when a word looks wrong even though when you, when you know it is spelled correctly. That sort of feeling is easy to provoke in the laboratory by asking people to repeatedly write the word. That's our contribution to uh, science. Next it opens up new possibilities to research all kinds of weird. will be given by Pietro Fernandez Castro. And our next lecture will be given by Pieto Fernandez Castro. Pieto? Hello. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, we like to study ocean turbulence. Turbulence is very important in the ocean because it shapes ocean currents, the ocean marine ecosystems, and our climate. And uh, we study turbulence in a coastal embayment for 15 days. And we wanted to understand how this turbulence impacts algae there. But we found something very different. We found turbulence was very intense every night, and we couldn't explain that by winds or tides, which are the normal factors that drive turbulence in the ocean. And by looking at the different piece of evidence, we found that the turbulence was driven by anchovies that came to this area to mate and fertilize their eggs. So we think our study is important because it's the first time someone is able to show that other than winds and tides, Animals, by doing sex, can mix the different layers of water together, <laughs> impacting, who knows, maybe our climate. <laughs> <laughs> and now questions. And let's start out with Eric. Do you have a question for somebody? I bet you do. I do. So I had the chance of meeting uh, Christine on online because I had the pleasure of awarding her her Ig Nobel Prize. What I didn't find out when we talked was just how you came up with the idea of studying nostril hairs. <laughs> yeah, so that's a really good question. So um, being in dermatology, we see a lot of hair loss patients in the clinic. Um, one condition that we see a lot is a condition called alopecia areata. It's a chronic autoimmune condition where there's a lot of patchy hair loss, not only on the scalp, but also on the eyebrows and nose. And so patients will come in and they'll talk about how their nose are, is so irritating, it's so dry, um, how they're getting like rhinitis. And I think a lot of it is what we theorize is secondary to the lack of nose hairs. And so looking in literature, we wanted to see if there's any evidence to support this, but there was no literature on the anatomy of nose hairs. And so we figured, why not? Let's just study this and you know, figure out how many nose hairs are in the nostrils and the impact of that. And how did you get hold of the cadavers? <laughs> <laughs> 
everyone has been asking me that. So being a med student at um, the University of California, Irvine, we have a fantastic program called the Willed Body Donor Program. Um, it's amazing. So generous people will donate their bodies to be cadavers. Um, for uh, medical students. And so it's a really amazing opportunity because we get hands-on experience dissecting the cadavers. And so we get to learn anatomy very, very well. Um, since this nose hair study is very new, we wanted to work with what we did have. And so since we had the cadavers as part of our program in school, we thought, why don't we just study it in cadavers first and see what we find there? Uh, Christine, would you have a question for Chris? Yeah. Hmm. How did you come about studying the jamais vu? So uh, jamais vu uh, is like uh, a, a side project, but I hope to make it more of a, a, a full project. But I was mostly doing work research on déjà vu, and it'd be possibly nice to ask who in the audience has ever had déjà vu. So like pretty much nearly everybody, and that's good. Deja vu is correlated with intelligence, so you can <laughs> give yourself a round of applause. Uh, but um, jamais vu is related to deja vu, so jamais vu is like the opposite. And so you may or may not have experienced it, or you may have experienced it but not know the, the name. And that's why we're, we're pleased to be here, because we'll be letting you know what it's called. So jamais vu is like, I often get it for words that look like they're spelt wrong. I once had it for the word this. Uh, and I looked at it and I just thought this word is wrong, but it was obviously right. So who's had jamais vu or who thinks they've had jamais vu? So I think slightly fewer people, but anyway, so we just got researching it because uh, we're, we, you know, human beings are lazy. Deja vu is infrequent and difficult to measure in the laboratory. And we just thought it would be easier to measure jamais vu. And it goes back to when I was a naughty school child. I wasn't very good at school. I had the punishment of just like Bart Simpson, I had to write lines. And I noticed that when I was writing lines, it all became meaningless. So I wondered whether that was like uh, jamais vu. And that was what Akira and I, that was our hunch. And that was what started us doing the research to try and find something in the laboratory that was comparable to this weird sensation we have in daily life. Mm, it's very fascinating. <laughs> Chris, would you have a question for Vieta? I would have a question. I, I, why do fish have sex at night? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good one, really. Yeah. I have no idea. Uh, yeah, I, I guess they, might, they probably came there where we are because it's quite a sheltered place. Why they came at night? I don't know. I'm not a fish sexologist, as okay. I must repeat <laughs> very often these days. Uh, but it's a, it's a very good question. Okay. Well, how about let's. Um, uh, uh, they probably maybe escape predators, actually. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so people like anchovies, you either love them or hate them. You <laughs> love them, I guess. Mm, I like them. Yeah. <laughs> Not in pizza, they get too salty. When okay. It's very cooked, right? But <laughs> and is it, is it species specific? Is it only anchovies that do this? You need no. big. No. Oh, okay. Many other fish. I mean, okay. aggregate for. Okay. Having sex basically <laughs> and, and then, yeah. But I think anchovies aggregate in very large numbers like other pelagic fish like sardine. Okay. But we don't, we don't know at all what's the extent, you know, what, how important that may be for ocean turbulence. We have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Vieto, do you have a question for anybody? Uh, I have a question for Chris actually. So I was thinking that your uh, research light some hope for people that are suffering. Uh, they are trying to forget their ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend. Okay. So how many times do you reckon you have to repeat <laughs> your ex-name so you can forget it? <laughs> yeah, very good. Well, so uh, we haven't run exactly that condition, but at least with a... I don't, you see, I don't think we'd ever forget it. They'd just begin to feel weirder and weirder. Yeah. So, but, but it... <laughs> With words, it's about, you need to say it for about a minute or about 30 times before it gets really weird. So, uh, yeah, it's probably not advisable to be caught saying your ex's name <laughs> with your current partner, I would suggest. But uh, I'm no expert on this. I things. take your advice. Though. Thank you. You saved my life. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, would you have a question for Christine? Yes, well, with, with Christine, I was really, like, 
nostrils seem interesting, but would it apply to other body parts? So d would we have asymmetries or, or, or differences between the two sides of the body? Oh, yeah. So asymmetry is very common on everyone's body. Everyone has asymmetry on their face, on their body parts, and it's completely normal. Uh, we don't fully know. People think it's part genetics, part embryology. Um, so we're still studying it. But we do know, for example, um, for our palate, the left palate develops later than the right palate. So that's why a lot of times when you look at cleft lip deformities, you see it more on the left than the right. So we do know that. But how it applies to the rest of the body part, we're still learning. But, but asymmetry is very, very normal. So it's okay to be a little lopsided. <laughs> and, uh, and our nasal hairs, they, they, they do things, right? They're not just there to be ugly. They, they have a service. <laughs> they're us. functional. Yeah. Yes, they're very, very functional. So nose hairs are very important. So, you know, they regulate temperature. Um, so if you're hot, they'll try to keep you cool. If you're cool, they'll try to keep you warm. And then they serve as this protective barrier against all those environmental allergens outside. So you'll notice that, you know, when you go outside and it's very polluted, you'll notice that your nose is a little bit more congested and that's because your nose where hairs are working. <laughs> okay, wow. Mm -hmm. Christine, did you have a question for the ATO? Ah, uh, yes. I was curious, so your study is in the um, Northwest Iberian Peninsula. Are there other hot spots where we have anchovies like spawning and causing the ocean mixing that we should look out for? We know that anchovies and all the similar fish are spawning in many places. So what's uh, particular about the area where we were uh, working is that uh, it's an upwelling area. So it's a place where deep waters come to the surface and deep waters have lots of nutrients. So there's a very, it's a really thriving marine ecosystem that happens in other places like off the coast of Peru, um, off the coast of Africa. Uh, and those are places where there are large aggregations of fish, but nobody has been there to measure this particular phenomenon. So we don't know what implications it may have. Chris, questions for anybody? Questions for anyone? I, think, I mean, I'd like to ask Eric if he's had jamais vu or déjà vu. I've had both. In fact, I'm getting a sense of deja vu right now <laughs> <laughs> from all of the previous Ig Nobel uh, ceremonies. Uh, but a, a question for you, uh, as, a, uh, as a researcher, I know that the number one question is funding. So how, how did you I assume you approached some funding body and said, I want to work on this. And how did you yeah. get them to agree? So, uh, so we didn't have funding for this research. Uh, and um, <laughs> you might be surprised by that. But uh, <laughs> we didn't have funding to do this research. How did we do it? Well, with a, quite a lot of experimental psychology, um, it's cheap. You, you learn a lot. Uh, about processes uh, and the, the, it's really the first stage uh, in a series of experiments which could get more expensive especially if there's any kind souls here who'd like to fund our research uh, but the the idea is is that um, we did it with the help of our undergraduate students so it's it's students in the university who are uh, participants the media likes to call them guinea pigs. I hate that idea. Uh, and they, 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 they do the experiments with us. It was Akira and I, we booked a room. So it's very cheap. We made uh, like response booklets. They all sat at a table writing words over and over and over again. And then, so, so it's cheap to run. Um, and then it does have value for funding. And, and that's what we're looking for at the moment. The idea is, is that what we understand about these feelings of strangeness and these conscious experiences, which, as I say, are, are, are called metacognition, that can help us understand uh, all kinds of different sorts of psychological distress and uh, cognitive problems. So that part would be fundable. Just asking people to write the same word over and over and over again, that's not, that's not fundable. <laughs> <laughs> Akira, do you have questions for anybody? Vieto. <laughs> yeah, excuse me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have one for Christine. So. Do you have any evidence that you know the asymmetry in the uh, 
hairs in your nose uh, correlates with other asymmetries in your body? Or put it that way, can we, from looking at the hairs in our nostrils, can we learn or predict something about other parts of your body or health? Yeah, I wish I could say I know, but I was looking into data about that, and there's just not much data about nose hairs and how it correlates with the <laughs> rest of the body. So, you know, this is why we're doing the research, and we're going to pivot from there, and hopefully we'll find more stuff. But so far, we don't know much yet. But, but you were saying that the, the difference between the two nostrils is, is maybe not statistically significant? Yeah, not statistically significant. So it's, it's very, very similar in both nostrils. It's really off by just eight hairs based on our data of about 20 people. So very similar. But everyone has a little bit of variation all over our body. You'll notice like, you know, one eyebrow is a little bit higher. I have one monolid, one double eyelid. Um, I'm sure I probably have one nostril with more hairs than the other, but do, I guess- Do you know which one? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to pluck it out and see, then I'll let you know. <laughs> but yes, yeah, asymmetry is very normal. We have time for maybe one quick question from each of you. Uh, Christine, one, one quick final question for anybody? Hmm. I'm curious, um, have you ever thought about your nose hairs? <laughs> Not until tonight. <laughs> well, I hope I inspired you. <laughs> Definitely. One, one final question. Um, so do you think this will open a new field of research on nose hairs? And also maybe can we use them to predict the future of people, like people look at their iris? I think so. I firmly believe in that. <laughs> But yes, hopefully it does. If you look in medical literature, there's no section on nose hair. So hopefully this will add in like at least a couple lines in there and then we'll get more info in there. <laughs> and uh, Chris? Well, Bieta, what's next for, what's next for you? Ne different species, different locations, or, or, or how's, it, how's it gonna work? So when people ask me about that is that I would say I never would recommend anyone to study biological mixing in the ocean because every time you try to find it, you never find it. You find it when you are not looking for it. Okay. But I think the place to look at the moment could be like in the high latitude oceans where you have this thin layer of fresh water that creates a very stratified layer. And there is also a lot of krill. So if there is one place in the world where I would look for it is yeah, down okay. in the southern ocean. Okay. But otherwise you can back to the day job, which is algae. Is that right? So it's, yeah, no? Yeah, more ocean turbulence in general. Okay. Yeah. We have about one minute left, so does anybody have one final quick question? Well, we could all just say the for a minute. Oh. No? <laughs> and now we'll snap out to the next group. Okay, everybody seated comfortably. Okay. One of our winners has given birth, as you can see. At least uh, assisted. In this second discussion group, here's who we have. Uh, Katie Tam. Katie, if you'd stand and take a bow. Katie traveled here today from Toronto, Canada. She and her team won the Ig Nobel Education Prize for methodically studying the boredom of teachers and students. Take a bow. And her colleague Christian Chan also is with us and Christian will be in a later discussion group. But Christian, take a, a bow. Miguel Giacotto is here from, he traveled from Vigo, Spain. And Miguel and his team uh, won the physics prize. You've already met one of his colleagues. They're the ones who measured the extent to which ocean water mixing is affected by the sexual activity of anchovies. So yet again, please take a bow and, uh, and get to applaud. And Adolfo Garcia. <laughs> Adolfo traveled here uh, from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Adolfo and his team won the Ig Nobel Communications Prize for studying the mental activities of people who are expert at speaking backward. <laughs> I 
<laughs> Eric Maskin also will be helping out with this discussion, and the discussion will be compared by Karen Hopkin. Karen? Um, I think we have to start with the one minute uh, talks. Yeah. Did you want to intro? I always tell people we screw up more than you think we will. So <laughs> if you're keeping count, add one to how, whatever your count already is. Right. To, uh, to give us some context, we're going to begin with one minute lectures by the two people here from prizes you have not yet heard a lecture on. First, Katie Tam. Yeah. Hello, everyone. In keeping with the theme of our boredom research, I'm going to deliver an absolutely boring, mind-numbing one-minute summary of our findings. <laughs> and guess what? If you're anticipating to be bored, you will very likely be. In our first paper cited by the award committee, we explored students' expectation in university lecture and lab experiment. We found that the mere expectation that a lecture will be boring can intensify boredom. And that's not it. In our second paper, we dived into the relationship between teacher and student boredom. In a two-week diary study, we found that when teachers felt bored, students tended to report lower learning motivation. And when students thought that their teachers were bored, they were also more likely to be bored and have less motivation to learn. I hope our research can inspire you about the depth of boredom in class. Thank you. And now, one minute summary of the work done by his team, Adolfo Garcia. Don't count that toward the one minute. <laughs> or voila. So you know how people sometimes get together in language meetups? They meet you know, for breakfast and they speak in French or Korean or whatever. Well, in Argentina, we found a group of people who got together to speak backwards over coffee. And uh, we said, OK, they all thought that it was a very stupid and useless skill. We confirmed that it's stupid, but it's not useless because it gives you insights into something that's fundamental. When you want to say cat, there's something in your brain that makes you say cat and not act or tack. That's called phonotaxis. It's what allows you to sequence sounds when you're talking. And these people are experts at sequencing sounds. That's what they do. They excel at it. So we scanned their brains and we found that this ability that we have to sequence phonemes based on their unusual expertise recruits specific temporal, frontal, and occipital parts of their brains and connections therefrom. And now the Ig Nobel Prize winners will ask each other questions about their work. Karen? I guess why don't we start with Eric again, since you uh, you were very good the first time. So. <laughs> <laughs> now you put all the pressure on me. So a, qu a question for Adolfo. Uh, th these people who can talk backwards, was this something that they were born with, that they have to develop it? How did they even come upon this skill? Uh, boredom. <laughs> uh, they, they, they all say that... Uh, <laughs> They all, so they all say that it's, it's, a, it's a little quirky mental game that they sort of indulged in. And uh, I think we, could all, we can all relate to that. I mean, there are people who are constantly doing maths in their heads, right? Uh, I myself, I, I'm always counting syllables. These people, they would look at a signboard and they would just flip words around and see what, what, you know, what, what that would sound like. So it wasn't something that they were born with. This is, it's not something dysfunctional. They can control it. Uh, uh, but it is something a little bit weird in the sense that it's very compulsive. They can't help themselves. You know, this, this sort of overtakes them. And, um, and, and they, they all describe different strategies that they have for it. Some of them, they visualize the words in their minds, right? And they, they flip the, the letters around. And some others, they do it just based purely on sound. So are they particularly good Scrabble players? <laughs> that we don't know. But we did uh, confirm that, as we expected, they have very, very good working memories in general. So if I give you guys a set of numbers now, I, I tell you 3, 14. See it. I'll tell you 19, 25, 80. Now I tell you 45, 16, 16, 92. Now I tell you 55, 63, 7, 49, 98. 
<laughs> it's getting trickier, right? I'm loading your working memory. Now these guys, it's not that they just flip around single words. They can speak backwards. You know, they'll tell you what they did yesterday backwards. And it takes a lot of planning. You have to remember all the things that you want to say in order to flip them around. So they, they have developed uh, astonishing uh, working memory skills. Um, and that was another thing that differentiated them from non-backward speakers. I wonder if they can do it in German. <laughs> um, so, uh, Adolfo, do you have a question for someone? Yes, yes I do. Um, the anchovy sex thing. <laughs> so, uh, they seem to influence uh, the ocean, uh, ac uh, oceanic activity, let's say. So my question is, What's going on during tidal waves? <laughs> <laughs> during tidal waves, what happens with the turbulence or with the anchovies? You choose the way you want to take this. <laughs> okay, imagine a tidal waves on the night with anchovies. That is a blast. <laughs> it can change this whole uh, current system of our oceans. <laughs> well, I'm joking, obviously. Miguel, do you have a, a question? Yeah, I have a question, Adolfo. Can you take one? <laughs> I can. Uh, I mean, there are several tech companies, I think, that they are developing these devices to read our minds. You know, you think that the techniques you used uh, in your paper and the knowledge you gain with that could help in that direction. Maybe, as they ask here several times, maybe a founding opportunity. All right. Um, so what we did here, they were offline brain scans. So we were not looking at these people's brain activity while they were reversing speech. So we as assessed their capacity to speak backwards, and then we took a look at uh, brain activity and brain structure, but not while they were doing it. These uh, technologies that are being uh, devised for, to actually read your mind in a way, they require online brain scans. So you need to think about something and we, ne we need to see what patterns of brain activity are happening as you're thinking about that or as you're reading a text. So that we can train models then to predict what, what you were thinking about just based on your brain activity. So not based on what we did. And I actually would wonder about the benefits of having something that can scan the way you, in which you can speak backwards. But if there's funding for that, the world has become very weird. <laughs> Katie, do you have a question? Yeah, also about Adolfo, like, uh, it's related to legal questions. Like, is there any potential applications for, for, for your findings for um, people with language-related disorder? That, 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 that's a good point. Uh, um, there are different speech and language dysfunctions uh, that happen to people who have perhaps sustained stroke or with neurodegenerative diseases, mostly seen in aphasias, which are neural disorders of language. And one of the uh, symptoms that you see more often uh, are known as paraphasias, which are changes in, in uh, when what you say does not match what you want it to say. Many of these, they are sound-based. So you want to say cat, but you end up saying tack, right? To understand the brain mechanisms that are responsible for sequencing phonemes might give you an insight of which brain regions you might want to stimulate or target in your therapeutic approaches for people who have these types of dysfunctions. And who has a question for Katie? Eric? <laughs> <laughs> Another... Uh researcher type question how how do you how do you measure boredom is it is it entirely self reported or is there some objective way <laughs> yeah in our research we mostly measure it self report like on a scale of 1 to 7 how bored you are yeah but ha have you thought perhaps of of going a different route and seeing uh, uh, what the brainwave activity is yeah like there are some research also to try to like measure boredom, like for example for, for eye tracking, like new uh, psychological like brain scanning, yeah. But I, like I need to like get there, <laughs> yeah. 
Um, as a writer, I had a really quick question um, for Katie. In the article on anticipation of boredom, the first sentence of your article is, how boring do you expect this article to be? <laughs> and what draft did that arise? And, and who inserted that in there? That's, that's good stuff. Yeah, because like, yeah, I, I wrote that sentence because I, I, I write a lot and then sometimes I get bored by my own writing. So, so I, I believe the reader get bored too. So I, I just ask them right away. <laughs> Katie, do you have another question for? Yeah, for me, like, because um, I read from your research, you spent like 14 days on a ship on the sea. Like, um, like what was the key challenge when you are do collecting data on the sea? Normally, the, the key challenge is to keep everything going because all the time the equipments are failing, the uh, environment is quite harsh. So normally you are quite focused on everything is working fine because uh, you have this tight schedule to sampling everything. The ship time is quite expensive, so you want to keep uh, taking as much as possible. And uh, you will not have opportunity later in the lab to correct what was done wrong during the survey. Before I forget, does someone have a question for um, Alan? Alan? Hello. Did you talk sometimes oh, in Spanish? Uh, en español, mejor. Uh, uh, español. Alan, ¿le hablas a veces al revés a tu padre cuando no quieres que sepa lo que piensas? Alan, did you talk sometimes backwards to your father when you don't want that he knows what you are thinking about? <laughs> 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 So cute. <laughs> Did Alan have a question for <clears throat> Yeah, he, he, he just uh, told me one. So for, for the boredom study, if you create... <laughs> there you go. <laughs> if you create a fun experiment, then you are tampering with your hypothesis. But if your experiment was boring, then you have a confound. How did you manage to create a, an experiment that was neither fun nor boring? Actually, that is not um, very difficult. We just give them a neutral video, like a lecture that is not too boring, too interesting, and then we pilot test that whether it increases or reduces boredom. If that didn't occur boredom, then it's like a kind of neutral. But uh, like I can claim myself to be an expert for making people bored. Like I do also of just like asking participants to copy references or like just uh, memorizing phone numbers. Like that's kind of really can bore people very effectively. <laughs> if you need someone to bore your participants, uh, I'm available. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have another question, Adolfo, for someone or? Um, yes, uh, for Eric. So, um, what's the main difference between a Nobel Prize and an Ig Nobel Prize? <laughs> <laughs> Around here, the Ig Nobel counts for more. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Eric, did you have any other burning questions? I, I'm still interested in these anchovies. So, so, <laughs> so, so it was it was a surprise to you. You were not That's expecting right. the, the no. Anchovies. But how how did how did you determine in the end that it was the anchovies? How did how did you narrow it down? Um, well, uh, we could take some eggs, and uh, the experts in in fishes, they know that that X belongs to anchovies. And we did also some samplings with uh, some equipment, echo sounders, that uh, the signal uh, that they registered, uh, it seems to be from anchovies. So we didn't know anything about uh, anchovies, but now we know that they have sex on the night. <laughs> <laughs> You must know some other dark secrets about anchovies too, right? <laughs> I can't tell you. <laughs> I think earlier you mentioned to me that you're not an expert on fish orgies, so. <laughs> <laughs> did you, Miguel, did you have another question for someone? Uh, yeah, uh, I think that from Adolfo, if, 
if we mix uh, studies and we think of uh, double negative, do you think if I repeat several times a word backwards, it will be a deja vu? No. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Katie, did you have anything else? Yeah, I'm curious, like, you study anchovy this time, will you study other kind of fishes in the future? Uh, well, now I, I pass to uh, mussels. I'm studying mussels now. <laughs> I don't know if I will take fishes uh, again, but now I'm studying a little bit of mussels. Do mussels um, have sex? Make turbulence. Uh, yes, they open the valves. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alan likes that. Uh, Adolfo, did you have any, any other questions? Um, yes. Um, what's, what's, what's the next frontier in anchovy sex research? Well, n not, not sure. Not sure. Um, could be a study another behavior of the anchovies, but I would prefer to to um, fix my, my attention on turbulence and mixing. I think that's quite important for climate change. And I'm going to start with uh, Miguel. We have just a couple minutes left. Uh, what sort of collaborations uh, do you envision uh, with your fellow Ig Nobel Prize winners? <laughs> well, I think that now, instead of going to fishes, I will start to use uh, another technique, valvometry, to see if uh, there is any signal in the opening and closing of the valves of muscles when they are spawning. <laughs> Katie? I would say, like, whether, like, being on the sea, like, collecting data, it's like, wow, um, you get, whether you get bored, like, <laughs> collecting data, like, on the sea for, like, anchovy sex, yeah. yeah. And also, like, I don't know, where the back was speaking, like, um, it's less boring. <laughs> yeah. um, well, it was, no, it, it was a very amusing study, to, to, to be honest. Uh, nothing close to anchovy sets, but still quite, quite, quite entertaining. Uh, but uh, in terms of the collaboration, I think this, this, this panel here is just begging for us to do the backward boring anchovy sex study. <laughs> I think that's good. And now we, now we drop, the ceremonial drop of a water bottle signals us to move on to group three. Let me introduce the people who are here for this discussion group. Tife Yap, stand and take a bow. Tife has traveled here from Houston, Texas. She and her team won the Mechanical Engineering Prize for reanimating dead spiders to use as mechanical gripping tools. <laughs> what are you holding in your hand? I have Use a microphone, please. No, oh, sorry. <laughs> to speak, have... not for the object. <laughs> I have a toy spider with me, not the real one today. <laughs> Could you ex briefly explain the parts of it so that everybody has uh, enough information that they can understand your research? Okay, um, so is this the one? Uh, minute? Under ex tell us the parts of that spider. Okay, um, so here we have a spider and we have the prosoma of the spider at the top. And then at the bottom we have the abdomen and these are their individual legs of the, eight legs of the spider. <laughs> <laughs> We just met Tifei Yap, meet Akira O'Connor. Akira with Chris Mullen, who you met before, and their team uh, won the Ig Nobel Literature Prize for studying the sensations people feel when they repeat a single word many, 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 many times. Uh, he has traveled here today from St. Andrews, Scotland. I get to take another bow. And Homei Miyashita. 
has traveled here from Kanagawa, Japan. He and his colleague won the Ig Nobel Nutrition Prize for experiments to determine how electrified chopsticks and drinking straws can change the taste of food. Okay. okay, yeah, I already have one. Okay. And Eric Maskin will be a part of the discussion. Uh, uh, Danny Adams will lead it. And we'll begin with one minute, uh, discuss, one minute lectures, really, by the people from the two prizes you have not heard discussions of before. First, Tifei, yeah, one minute discussion. Okay. I would like the audience to please grip tight to their seats because I'll be talking about how we turn inanimate spiders into robotic grippers. So we are soft roboticists, so we try to make robots that are soft. And we're always looking to find new and interesting materials that can simplify the fabrication process of robots. So in traditional manufacturing, um, usually the manufacturing process is very complicated and many steps. So we thought of this clever idea to use biotic materials, which are inanimate materials that are derived from nature. And directly, in our case, we have a dead spider, and we directly use it as a robotic component in our work. Thank you. And now a one-minute summary of his prize-winning work by Homei Miyashita. OK. OK. Um, have you ever licked a battery? Yes. Huh. Yeah, of course I have. And if you know, if you have, you know the electricity has a taste because it, you know, uh, stimulates the electric, uh, sorry, uh, taste, uh, taste buds, you know, uh, taste receptors. And uh, so for 13 years, we've been doing researching about the, uh, the use of electricity to the, that kind of uh, tablewares to control the taste of food. And um, not only so the stimulation, uh, we move the so, uh, ions in the food or in the mouth. And by gathering uh, the sodium ions near the tongue, um, it can enhance the saltiness of food, especially low sol sodium food. So yeah, it contributes to health. Thank you so much. <laughs> And now the Ig Nobel Prize winners will ask each other questions about their work. Danny? Uh, Akira, I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to go first. OK. Um, I have a question for Tefei, uh, which is, is it only spiders that you can do this with, or can you do this with, with other animals? So currently, with our method, um, we rely on the hydraulic mechanism that spiders do have. So other insects do not have this mechanism. But there are other um, insects, such as a whip scorpion and even mites that have this hydraulic mechanism that you could probably think of using this. OK, so, so really, really nice creatures then. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, you can add another function using scorpions, for example, cutting or <laughs> yeah, like a loop. Yeah. Take something off the loop. Yes, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but so related to that, is it? Uh, so I noticed with um, with your video, with the demonstration, it's it's a fairly straightforward kind of grabbing mechanism where um, all of the legs operate at the same time. Is it possible to? to kind of isolate um, individual components, legs, so, so you can do perhaps more precise actions? Yeah, so currently the spiders that did, um, they lose control over their valves in each leg. So that's why when we um, pressurize it, all the legs open up. So currently we're looking into different methods of trying to have this single leg actuation to study maybe the joints, um, how the pressure affects the joint of the angle, and even achieve like um, locomotion of the spiders. It's a work in progress. <laughs> wow. Uh, would you like to ask Homi a question about his electronic... Uh, uh, from, from me? I'm sorry, no, I've... Tifei. Okay. okay. Um, what is your favorite food that you have <laughs> ate using your chopsticks and bowl? Um, <laughs> first of all, I like ramen, especially, <laughs> especially in Japanese, shio ramen, it means salty ramen. And, and um, there is a low salt 
shio ramen in Japan, but it is not so good. <laughs> and so yeah, for to eat that, I developed a new type, the bowl type equipment, and because I I want to use not this equi equipment, I I want to use waribashi. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I attached the, the equipment to the bowl, not to the tableware in here. So you know, Japanese people hold the ball with left hand. So uh, that's the mechanism. Really cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, would you just show off your little wrist thing there? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Wait a moment. Yes. It it was very difficult to, you know. Explain using a mic. Okay. <laughs> can we have you hold the oh, mic? Oh, thank you. Oh, okay. I can have you hold the mic. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, this, this, not this. This is a mic that magnifies the sound, and this is a chopstick that magnifies the taste. Okay. So, okay. Uh, this is a smartwatch-like device, and uh, this the band is uh, conductive rubber. And when I uh, turn on the, you know, I can control the level and uh, select the waveform. And by connecting it in the single wire, and, and when, I u when I eat in this way, so electrical s flows from chopsticks to f the food, to the food, to the tongue, and the two to the body, and flows into my arm and back. back. So, so using that electricity, uh, we control the taste. Thank you. Super cool. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Do you have a special name for that circuit? Oh, yes, uh, <laughs> it's a product name. It's, a, it's oh. called elec elec Electric Salt. Electric Salt. Electric salt. Okay. Yeah. How many? Do you have a question? Oh, yes. Um, to Akira or? Anybody you want. Okay. I, I see. I see. <laughs> I see. Yeah, the distance is very different. Okay. I like the title of your thesis. You know, it's humorous and, you know, it's very, um, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, accurate. I mean, so I think that's the perfect name of the title. But I, I'd like to know, is there a other option of varieties of titles? Yes. Uh, th yeah, thank you for asking that question. So uh, in case you didn't notice um, when the, the, ti the, the study title page was shown. Um, I think the, the first phrase in the study is the, 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 the induction of jamais vu. And this was, um, this was a title that um, when Chris and I sat down to, to work on the paper, Chris was, Chris was very keen on this title. Um, it, was, it was Chris's idea. But to, to answer your question directly, there was an alternate version which had 28 thes, uh, <laughs> because that was the average number of thes required to generate jamais vu in people. Now, this has had some interesting consequences. Um, we got uh, some confused emails from copy editors, um, <laughs> and Chris was telling me yesterday that um, one of his uh, colleagues um, had, um, had chastised, I think, one of Chris's students um, for clearly messing up her references uh, because she'd, she'd repeated a few too many words uh, in, in her reference list. So um, it, it's had some in interesting consequences. It's, it's been um, a good topic for conversation as well, a good conversation starter. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think Chris was absolutely right to, to suggest very strongly that we went with that title. Was one of the hurdles like the word count for titles in journals? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think it was it was just getting over the the copy editors um, kind of the perceptions of our incompetence in choosing. <laughs> um, I actually I'm just want to follow up a little bit. You have um, all three of you have some wonderful phrases, not just the first. Uh, not just the 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 the. the. Um, so uh, I was particularly um, uh, entran in, entranced by interpretive seizure, um, and then in the title, word alienation and semantic satiation. Um, please explicate. Yes. Um, so 
there, there's a long history, actually, of, of this sort of research. We, when Chris and I um, were working on this in the early 2000s, we thought we'd, we'd happened across something that was, um, that was quirky and interesting and that we were going to report it for the first time in the scientific literature. And it was only after presenting, um, presenting I think, a, a, a talk at a, at a conference that we had uh, a, a professor, a professor who would go on to examine my PhD thesis. Um, he spoke to Chris and he said, well, I know you've, you've spoken about this as, uh, as something novel and it, it, it is very interesting, um, but it isn't novel. Um, in 1904, there had been a, a, a team of researchers uh, who had published on this uh, using, using these phrases that, that you picked out. Um, and had, had described exactly what we thought we were describing for the first time. Now, there, there's a kind of interesting angle to this, I think, in that um, this was a team of, of, uh, of female researchers, so it was a team of two women, and it was not, not just any old women, um, but um, one of those women was uh, Margaret Floy Washburn, who was the first uh, recipient of a PhD uh, in psychology from uh, an American university and the second female president of the APA. So it was surprising, I guess, that, um, that her work had fallen out of, out of fashion within psychology. But she, um, she predicted this. In one of her APA addresses, she said that the rising kind of tide of, of behaviorism, of, of being focused on measuring things objectively and moving away from introspection within psychology, was, was going to see research like hers forgotten. And so it was, um, that was exactly what happened. She was very prescient in, in predicting that. I think there's, there's a lot to be said about the, the kind of feminization and masculinization of certain, um, certain aspects of psychology and, and who we therefore choose to kind of remember in the canon of science. Um, but I think the first step to putting that right is to, to kind of acknowledge that, that there's some great research uh, that has been done by, uh, by people that we don't remember. Uh, uh, and it is really important to let people know about Yeah, about that. that's a great point. Um, so yeah, semantic satiation, um, the, th that, was a, that was a term that, would, that has been used uh, to describe this feeling, um, as, as, uh, as are some of the other terms that, that you mentioned as well. So we were hitting our keywords there as well. Um, Eric, did you have anything for, for anybody? Question for, for Hope A. Do, do you see, um, this is again is something a, uh, a researcher would ask, do you see any commercial possibilities? <laughs> oh yes, um, in Japan it is commercially available next month. Okay, congratulations. <laughs> And, and, and do, you ha do you have a patent for it? So? Yes, a little bit. A little okay. bit. Yeah. <laughs> a little Very bit. good. Um, oh, May, I'm, I actually want to bring you to the first sentence of your oh, paper. I forgot that. <laughs> Catfish are described as swimming tongues. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, they, they are known, uh, are they electric fish as well? They um, yes, I, you know, I'm not a researcher of, of that field. Okay. Yes, but, uh, you know, you need the in, intro yeah, guy. I, I like the, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, he made a good title, but <laughs> for me, the first sentence is, is, should be very impressive. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the most impressive knowledge about taste was that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have a follow-up question for somebody? Oh. Yeah, um, to you. <laughs> okay, um, you know, uh, it's a little bit difficult. Uh, the, the, the question is simple, uh, is that uh, have you ever had an argument with a journalist from, from the media? But uh, because I, you know, for example, I have many experience of the argument with journalists. You know, may, some people said this electric shock or something, or 
you know, it's it's a uh, it's d different, uh, you know. So, but um, and especially I uh, I think your research is very great, and um, you know, uh, for example, we regularly use wood or we regularly would use wool. So um, it's dead organisms, <laughs> you know? So, um, so it's, it's very great uh, if the materials that useful for robotics are cheap and available everywhere. Okay. So I think her research is very great. <laughs> however, <you>. however, <laughs> when, when I, when I see the some kind of news of Ig Nobel Prize. I, I, no, I don't know. I'm, I don't know. So you have to argument with that uh, uh, journalist. So I thought. So have you ever that experience? Um, I think most journalists are quite nice. Um, most people do ask about the ethics and we will try to explain it as um, we do follow some scientific procedure with the euthanization of the spiders. There are memes and uh, mean tweets online, but I think <laughs> that was the, those were the extent of it. But most, um, mostly everyone are really um, supportive and really excited about the work, like you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank I you see. for the question. I um, I've, I've uh, usually worked with uh, vertebrate animals, and I, it's amazing to me that people care about wolf spiders. Where's, where's our, our arachnophobe? <laughs> okay. um, uh, you also have some, uh, <laughs> uh, you actually, um, there's a, a crossover with your work um, and, and mine actually. So I study electricity and one of my very favorite stories is how Venus flytraps snap shut. And you mentioned that actually, that that's a, an interesting, um, a, a, it's, a, it's a biophysics story that's a really interesting one. Do you, do you know much about them? Can you can you talk? Are you going to use Venus fly traps as grippers? Yeah. So there's actually some work out there that um, some researchers have used a Venus fly trap and use electricity to use it as a gripper. Um, and there's a lot of bio inspired work where they have looked at the mechanisms for uh, Venus fly traps where they have like the trigger hairs, I think. Yeah. Um, and they use that um, to create a really quick. Um, snap true instability to create like a gripper. So people have done that before. They have, spider. that's amazing. Yes. And I don't think people would be so uh, anxious <laughs> about. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And now the shy people, the, the final group of Ig Nobel Prize winners. Uh, Dan, is that a spider you have with you? Yes, it's the same one that Tifei showed us earlier, uh -huh. the plush spider. Uh, now, you did your work before you moved down to Houston. You did your, your previous study and work here at MIT, is that correct? Yes, I had uh, five years at MIT for the PhD, and then I had a couple years also at Harvard for a postdoc. Oh. Ah, did you leave any spiders behind up here? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't start the spider work up here. I did see a lot of dead spiders, especially at Harvard. I think MIT, in my view, is a little bit cleaner. <laughs> You've just heard valuable information, all of you in the audience. Right. Let me introduce the four Ig Nobel Prize winners in this final group. Natasha Mesinkowska. Please stand and take a bow. <laughs> she traveled here from Irvine, California. She's the leader of the group that won the Ig Nobel Medicine Prize for the work with cadavers and their nostril hair. All right. Dan Preston traveled here from Houston, Texas. He's the leader of the group that won the Ig Nobel Mechanical Engineering Prize for the work with reanimating dead spiders. <laughs> Christian Chan traveled here from Ikbao, Ikbao. <laughs> Travel here from Tokyo, Japan. The team originally um, did, was based and did their work uh, at the University of Hong Kong, in Hong Kong, and now they have scattered to various places. Uh, they won the education prize for something you've heard a little about for mechanically, mechanically, methodically studying the boredom 
of teachers and students. Another bow, please. And please welcome Sung Min Park. Sung Min was based at Stanford University until recently. He has just begun a new job at a university in Singapore, and he traveled here today from Singapore for this. Uh, please remain standing while I describe your prize. Dr. Sun Min Park, he is a physician, won the public, Ig Nobel Public Health Prize for inventing the Stanford Toilet, a device that uses a variety of technologies, including a urinalysis dipstick test strip, a computer vision system for defecation analysis, an anal print sensor paired with an identification camera, and a telecommunications link, all to monitor and quickly analyze the substances that humans excrete. <laughs> Eric Maskin will be a part of this discussion also. You've heard one minute summaries of all the other research, but you haven't heard about the Stanford toilet. So here we'll begin with a one minute summary of his research work by Sonia Park. Okay, this is a uh, precision health. Can you hear me? Okay. So this is a Stanford healthcare toilet. So it meant to monitor your bowel movements and uh, all activity that you're doing on the toilet. But the one important thing is you have to discriminate, uh, not discriminate, I mean, distinguish people who's using the toilet because uh, it meant to monitor your health, right? You don't want to mix up with your family member. So we use a fingerprint scanner at the flusher. So after you're finishing it, you flush it and the, your identification will be annotated. And we're using the anal print technology that looking at your anus, that match to you because it's as unique as your fingerprints. <laughs> so we have a lots of ethical consideration and uh, we have some application to the COVID-19. So uh, it's another era of uh, technology yes. that yes. infiltrate yes. your toilets. Thank you. Oh, you can take a bow for that. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> Don't waste your waste. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with Natasha. Natasha, do you have a question for Sung Min? I mean, seriously, like, that's some crazy stuff. So you are responsible for my paranoia of toilets now. I double look now, because I mean, I don't know. But here's the thing. So you say that anal prints are very unique. Yes. <clears throat> Somebody pops a baby or two. They have hemorrhoids. What just happened to my anal prints, sir? Uh, yes, I think uh, the anal print technology will have uh, some impactful stuff on it because uh, we're trying to detect any kind of anomaly from your anus. So as soon as you have hemorrhoid or anal fissures or any other conditions that it's not normal, we're detecting it and notifying you that you have to meet a doctor. So that's our strategy. So it's just like the same as your like a face, uh, what do you call, face ID. Because Face ID usually accepts you when, whenever you wear glass, whenever, even though you wear a mask, it still accepts you as you, right? But my phone doesn't open every time. Yeah, that's true. Just say, yeah. <laughs> just mind us. But so, anal print is kind of similar technology. If morphology is slightly changed, but we know it's someone's, and uh, if we detect anything different, we can notify you to see your doctor. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> so Min, do you have a question for Dan? Oh, oh yes. yes, so uh, <laughs> it, it was, was very fascinating work. So it's a uh, kind of, I usually play the game, uh, the, the uh, video game that's called the Diablo 2. Oh. And uh, it always reminds me of a uh, necromancer over there. Reanimate, <laughs> right? So do you have any plan to to make a Iron Man type of Spider-Man. <laughs> 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 so, 
So definitely for the spiders themselves, as Tifei mentioned earlier, we're trying to work on the individual actuation of each leg such that we can get locomotion. And then we could think of the spider with maybe the little backpack, right? With some instrumentation, it could walk around and maybe surveil or take data, something like this. So maybe that's the spider version, right? Um, of this Iron Man suit. <laughs> But so was that how you want to change humanity? Like, I feel like, okay, so here's the thing. We torture the young dogs with these crazy ideas, but I feel like we all come from a good place, right? So how do you want to change humanity with the stuff you're doing? Yeah, I mean, this is a really important question. And so I think that the timeline, maybe to see neck robotics change humanity could be a little bit longer, or maybe it won't change humanity in the long run. We think that it's important to be creative about the ideas that we explore to give the chance that maybe it could have an impact in the future. But I'll mention that we have a couple of things, of course, that maybe have the more near-term impact. Uh, a lot of the work that we're doing in the soft robotics is enabling assistive technologies for wearables that people are able to use um, now or maybe in the next few years uh, to help with mobility limitations. That's nice. Good job. Thanks. Dan, um, would you have a question that um, Christian Chan might find uh, so challenging that he finds it interesting? <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my best. I was wondering about the study. So people seem to have maybe different interests or proclivities, things that they like. Uh, maybe some people like a certain subject for a lecture. Maybe other people like a different subject. So what sort of separates this from just maybe hearing the topic of the lecture thinking that you might be bored because you have experienced many times in the past being bored with this topic and then being bored by the topic? Well, so of course there are, uh, um, there are different layers of uh, individual differences. Um, so we, uh, that's why we want to do um, experiments in a systematic way with uh, multiple participants. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully by, through randomization, uh, we'll separate, you know, like it will cancel out each other even if there's some individual differences in proclivity, what they're interested in. Um, but we try to do it both in the classroom and in the lab. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the classroom, um, in some cases, I'm actually the lecturer, so it definitely is not boring to begin with. <laughs> uh, so sure. yeah, so if there's any boredom in there, it's just the student's problem, I think. <laughs> Christian, do you have any questions about nostril hairs? Yes, uh, why wouldn't I? Um, yeah. Do you think there's something to do with, you know, um, handedness such that those who are right handed might have fewer yeah. nostril hair because they're picking their nose with their right hand? So, Listen, so this is how this whole study came about. <laughs> no, seriously, as a physician, I can't prescribe anything anymore. Like I want to give you something insurance company is going to be like, forget about it. Let me tell you what you need to get. So there's the condition that Dr. Uh, Pham mentioned, Christine, is the alopecia areata, for which there are new medications that are coming out, right? So if you want to give these medications, the companies say you can't, it's only to grow hair, you're not allowed to use this medication. So I was literally like digging for reasons to give them a reason to give me the medications. The patients with alopecia areata, about more than half, especially kids, have a lot of allergies, a lot of asthma, and a lot of them drip and have no nose hair, so we're like, is there anything that these nose hairs do? Can we claim like, hey, this kid does not have nose hairs. So just please like give him the medication. So that's how it all started. So like when people are like, oh, this is funny and stupid. I'm like, no, we had to be creative. And we went to all the Grey's Anatomy and nobody ever said a single thing about nose hairs. So like, there's nothing. So we called all my ENT colleagues. They're like, it's just in the way. But things that we found out, for example, if you've been through chemo, so people from the cadavers that pass with cancers, didn't have any nose hair. So what does that put you for risk time, right? Um, laterality, we try to prove. We know that on the scalp, one side of the head has a little bit more than the other side, right? Um, there is that difference in hair. I haven't really noticed in our other body parts, but that's what I have to say to kind of like defend that whole, like the human aspect to the fun stuff that we do. So there's a lot of talking for a little bit. <laughs> Eric Maskin, I wonder if you might have four quick questions or, or comments um, to give an, ep an economic perspective on each of <laughs> these four pieces of research. Gosh, that, that's, a, that's a tall order. Uh, <laughs> 
Um, well, economists are, are always interested in, uh, in, in, in marketing, and so I was, uh, uh, I was intrigued to hear in, in, in the last panel how the, uh, the chopsticks were going to be marketed. But I, but I wonder, uh, oh yes, we, ha we, ha we, uh, yeah. we have a, uh, we have a Stanford toilet with us. So, so it, is, is this going on the market? And for that matter, uh, can, can we expect uh, hydraulic, uh, can, can we expect spiders used for hydraulics and gripping to, uh, to go on the market? Well, I thought you were suggesting that they combine. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we could make a me. combination of spider that captures stool sample. There, there, there we go. <laughs> So we're on the market too. Oh, uh, we you have, are. Yeah. So we're. Are, are you allowed to use the Stanford name? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but they'll collect proceeds probably because you did it while you were there. <laughs> so use it. So yeah, uh, toilets. Uh, we're working with. Uh, we're working with uh, the electronic bidet company right now. So to make it commercialized, actually. So I think uh, we hope we can release the first version in next year. But it doesn't have an anal print technology on it. <laughs> I have a question for, uh, because you're an expert in the uh, game theory, right? So we're having a difficult times to recruit the participant for anal print. <laughs> Before you go further, we have a room full of people. Any volunteers here? We compensate, actually. We compensate for deficit. So in well, right, game, we're getting back into economics and right. you have an expert. How much do you compensate? Uh, so that was my question. So what's the game theory point of view? How much should I compensate them? Now the, 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 the idea, the game theoretic point of view is, is to make it a competition. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Chris, Christian, your comments on this? <laughs> uh, well, we are always bored sitting on the toilet. Well, the discussion you've just heard, do you think this conceivably might interest students who are not terribly interested in other things? Uh, and they are interested in their own feces? <laughs> Maybe we should not pursue this. <laughs> or other people's? Um, yeah, but yeah, we should pay attention to, yeah. And when you pay attention, you don't get bored. So when you start paying attention, maybe you won't be so bored of your own waste. Yeah. Did you know that Dr. Park was compared to Salvador Dali at one point? Do you want to elaborate on that, Dr. Oh, Park? Oh, yes. Salvador Dali was so much obsessed with the human anus. So he investigated the human anus. So he counted the number of creases around it. And he concluded that there's a 35 to 37 creases around it. But it's uh, as unique as a fingerprint. So we're kind of inspired by that, you know, uh, that idea. But uh, uh, as I mentioned, we have a really difficult time to find, uh, you know, participants. So we just utilize that some medical depository to, to uh, we're working with a colorectal surgeon. So they provided like a, more than a hundred image of the human anus, so we conclude that it's a very unique. Okay. Um, Sumin, we've, uh, I, I have been asked many questions because I'm connected with the prize, and I'm sure you've been asked many, many more. It, it, it should be discussed by you. Um, could you talk a little bit more about some of the privacy concerns? Oh, yes. Yes, privacy. <laughs> yes. Um, so biggest issue is that uh, the toilet itself is regarded as your sanctuary for privacy, right? Because uh, all the privacy starts from your toilet because you don't want to get invaded by somebody else. So that's the definition of privacy. And uh, we're actually work, uh, trying to install sensors that monitor your activity, right? That actually contradict to each other. So uh, for the privacy wise, we always discuss it. Uh, it's more like a game theory too, again. So that uh, what's the benefit that we can provide and what's the potential infringement of your privacy? So we're always like, you know, balancing between the two. But the thing is we need to prove it 
worth worthy of your health monitoring. So that's what we are working on. Natasha, you have a question. So you know how there's a shy bladder? Is there like a shy anus? Because I, 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 like, would you guys, I don't know, like, yeah, I'm being honest. Is there? Because you guys are monitoring everybody. For anybody who's not familiar with the term, could you? Shy, like how you can't, like if there's people talking, you can't use the, you can't pee in the public, but am I the only one? <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, so Eric. <laughs> No comment. No, so there's uh, these documentaries about like how people win the lottery and how like their life is okay for a year, but it all goes downhill, like so super heartbreaking. What happens to a Nobel Prize winner after you? <laughs> we, we end up on a panel like this. Before you, before you answer that, could you clarify your question? Is your question connected to the previous discussion? Or? <laughs> Game me. <laughs> How else could I have had the pleasure of sitting with all of you tonight without a, without a Nobel Prize? I mean, Prize? it's a privilege. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Christian, do you have any questions for anybody? Yeah, Daniel, um, I'll be curious to see pictures of uh, you know, Halloween costumes coming from your lab. <laughs> You know, do you have any, is there any, you know, integration between those two endeavors? <laughs> we haven't incorporated any of the real spiders or the biotic materials in the costumes, but there have been a few uh, that I've seen. I think that, um, I didn't really have this as a costume, but when the work came out, my mom sent to me a Spider-Man shirt. So it's on people's minds, I guess, you know? Oh, that's cool. Moms are cool. Yeah. And Dan, would you mind talking for just a moment or two about your personal history of feelings about spiders before you came to this work? Don't love spiders. Um, the work was exciting enough to us that I decided we could have them in the lab. <laughs> so we have basically a fridge full of spiders that's in the lab. Uh, not a big problem, but you know, I think that uh, even with the work out and then some of the press that it's gained, I still continue to not like spiders. I think that there's actually been a little bit of karma because after this work came out, I was taking a shower and a pretty big spider just appeared on the wall. It really startled me. And so, um, Does it bite you? It did not bite me. Oh. I, ah, we missed a chance to be a Spider-Man. I, <laughs> I took care of the spider. So you're saying but, this was a, a gripping experience? <laughs> you couldn't say so. They didn't like that. They did not like that. I'm, I'm just, just translating. <laughs> yeah. um, you may be aware we gave an Ig Nobel Prize a few years ago to somebody who professionally studies spiders, that is his profession. And he won an Ig Nobel Prize because he wrote a paper explaining he discovered that many of the people who study insects, many professional entomologists, are frightened of spiders. Has that been your experience in your <coughs> recent work? Not so much frightened. We got pretty lucky. And the lead author, T. Fei, who you just heard from, actually is OK with spiders. In fact, hates roaches. So we got lucky there, I think. <laughs> And that is the end of the final discussion. We have just a couple of brief things. Uh, first, I would like to, well, let me give our thanks, first of all. Uh, I want to thank the MIT Museum for inviting us here and making it possible, uh, especially in this beautiful new building. This is one of the first things happening here. And thank you especially to Kate Silverman Wilson. Kate, could you come and take a quick bow? who really made all this happen. Our stage manager, David Kessler, who brought all the pieces together. Slideshow jockey, Jerry Sullivan, made all that happen. Um, Bruce Pechek and the video crew. The minor domos, if you come out here for a real quick bow, who made all the moving parts move properly, Michelle Liguori, Roxy Freeman, Elizabeth Kozla, Susan Kaney, and Kiyoshi Furusawa. Kiyoshi came here from Tokyo today to do this, and a month from now, Kiyoshi will be running a very similar event at a beautiful science museum in Tokyo. Thanks. Here are some of the people you met tonight. Um, also, I will explain this in a couple of minutes. It, the meaning will become clear why I'm describing them this way. Ice cream gods, Gus Rankatori and Corky White. Woo! 
Everyone here, there is ice cream in your immediate future in just a few minutes. Our discussants, Karen Hopkin, Danny Adams, Eric Maskin, and all of the Ig Nobel Prize winners. Could all, everybody I named, could you please come up and stand here? Um, you can get your cameras out if you like. This is going to be a pointless photo opportunity. So all the winners come here, gather together in a line. Okay. Domos and DK, if you could help um, align people here. Okay, quickly, quickly. Beep, beep, beep. You will never, ever again see this combination of humanity all in one place. Okay. You take your pictures now. And I also want to mention that uh, right afterwards, you all have lovely printed programs, which Jerry Sullivan put together. Um, again, you'll never see this combination of people again. If you want to get their autographs and create historic items from those pieces of paper, feel free to do it. The final thing we're going to do before we go down the hall for ice cream provided by Toscanini's, which we'll be doing right down there in a minute. Before we do that, one final thing. Uh, Chris Mullen and Akira O'Connor, who did the research on words repeated often, especially the word the, will uh, grab your microphones, please, each of you. And they will lead us, all of us, everyone in this room who'd like to do it, in a group recitation, repeating the word, repeating, repeating, repeating the word the, the, the. So yes, uh, we'll finish with an experiment. We'd like you to pay attention to us. We'll tell you when to stop. Um, so from now on, I just want you to say the, 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 the. 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 The, 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 Thank you all for coming tonight.